All right, gang, today we're going to talk about the influence of the Enlightenment on the art and how it changed art and technology. Most of this is going to be on your notes on page 61, uh, but some of this is not, so you're going to have to add this wherever you can on page 60 or 61, okay? So uh, this is all on there. So first of all, um, Enlightenment in the arts is all about order and structure. Remember, this is the age of reason, the age of logic, so art, literature, um, actual painting, and music all are very logical in their order, very logical in their approach, and very logical in their structure. Uh, they also show a very heavy Greek and Roman influence. Now, beginning with the Renaissance, uh, Greek and Roman art and architecture uh, had made a comeback, but the Enlightenment artists e show even more of that um, and very similar scenes from Greek and Lo Roman life. Uh, the significant change here are the subjects of the art in particular. Um, there are, people are now posed in more natural poses, even natural scenes, more as they would appear in real life, even more so than the Renaissance. And also there are now, or is now, an emergence of action scenes in the artwork, an action of people doing things, um, people running from things, people actually uh, in action poses, fighting on a boat trying to save their lives, such as that. And we'll, I'll show you some of that. And the books and, and music even has a lot more action than before. So a couple of major um, musicians or composers of the era are Johann Sebastian Bach. The thing that you need to remember is that this is what we generally refer to as classical music. Technically, it's not classical, or some of it's not classical music in terms of the era, uh, but it's what we're going to associate with classical music. So Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, we're not <laughs> real sure when he was born, but he died in 1750. <clears throat> and he composed most of his work for piano and keyboards. Um, most of his work was uh, composed with um, piano and keyboards. And like I said earlier, it was very ordered and logical. Uh, often you have themes in the music repeating themselves going forward, then go back and repeat, going forward, then go back and repeat, and having slight differences in them. And we'll listen to those, and you will listen to those. Um, you listen to them some today in class, and we'll listen to them some tomorrow as you're writing. Um, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was a child prodigy, so I want you to think of him as kind of like the Justin Bieber of the time period. He was this real young guy um, who everybody wanted to have write music for him. Um, he lived from 1756 and to 1791, and he was actually, um, he wrote and was really young, and he became re really famous at a really young age. People from all over, kings, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, the Austrian kings, the German princes, even the French, wanted him to come live at their court and compose works for him. Um, he was from Austria originally, and like I said, he was a child composer and became really famous because of that, really young guy. Well, in art, the main thing you need to know is that they have action scenes, uh, they have scenes of public events going on, and that they are scenes of nature and actually living people. Uh, portraits are, are really popular, are really common. Um, one of the most famous artists of the era is a guy named Eugene Delacroix. Uh, Eugene Delacroix lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and he painted a lot of paintings, and his most famous, or one of his most famous, is called The Massacre at Chios. Uh, the Massacre at Chios depicts the Ottoman Empire. You can see the Ottoman here uh, taking over and defeating uh, the Greeks. Um, the Greeks were trying to fight for their independence from the Ottoman Empire, and obviously the Ottomans didn't like that. This also spurred up a lot of anti-Muslim sentiment, anti-Ottoman sentiment in Europe at the time because this was a very public uh, form of art. And now the Greeks, the Christian Greeks, were being persecuted by the uh, Ottoman who were Muslim. And so it actually wound up it, uh, creating some um, animosity toward Muslims because of that. But this is an action scene. Uh, you see people in action. You see the horse. Um, and you can see the focal point here, the people suffering, the people dying um, there. Um, literature, and in literature, a new form of art emerged, and that is the novel. I told you guys yesterday about Voltaire and Candide. Well, another famous novel from the era was uh, called Don Quixote by a guy named Miguel de Cervantes. Uh, Cervantes was a Spanish writer, um, and Quixote is about a guy who basically uh, has these fantasies about doing great deeds. Um, and he's a knight, even though he's not actually a knight, uh, but he pretends to be a knight, and he goes around. And doing these great things. And basically, Don Quixote makes up all this stuff in his head. Um, again, Quixote is a novel by Miguel de Cervantes um, and is an example of enlightenment art because it's a real guy going through natural scenes, scenes um, even though it is largely based in his mind and um, on his own. 
All right, so let's talk about revolution in technology. Technology had a really big uh, change in the world as well during the Enlightenment and the Revolutionary Era. From uh, 1650 to 1850 was a really big change in a lot of technology. So first of all uh, came the invention of all-weather roads. And you're going to have to add these notes somewhere else on your notes. Uh, was the invention of all-weather roads. Now, all-weather roads means that you can drive on them in all weather. The best example of this is the McAdam crushed stone. Um, McAdam was a Scotsman, and he figured out that if you took really small stones um, and just patted down the dirt and put really small stones and leveled it over top of that, you could have a really good, reliable um, road that would last a long time and water would drain right off of it using this. It's called a McAdam road, and actually there are McAdam roads still around in our country today. Um, the Agricultural Revolution took place during the era of revolution, and that's a little minor or smaller revolution, but it had a tremendous impact on food production. Um, one, selective breeding. Uh, <clears throat> farmers in the Netherlands uh, began to selectively breed not only their crops, but also their animals to get specific characteristics. Bigger cows so they could get more meat, uh, smaller or shorter cows so they could uh, live on the hillside, whatever. They began to selectively breed uh, specific animals to create the type or breed of animal that they wanted best, uh, be it a cow, be it a horse, be it a dog, whatever, or sheep. Um, that's how they did it. They also began a new uh, crop rotation method. Now, crop rotation had been in use for centuries, uh, but now they began to figure out, oh, we don't have to leave a field completely fallow or open in order to get crops on it. What they learned was that by planting certain crops on a rotational basis in different fields throughout the years, you could actually repl replenish the soil and not use all the nutrients in the soil and replace the nutrients that it took out. Um, also in this time, an invention in technology was the McCormick Reaper. That's right, just down the road here in August County. Um, Cyrus McCormick's farm produced the McCormick Reaper. What it did was greatly uh, hasten or greatly quicken the ability to harvest grain, um, and that dramatically increased food production. You no longer needed as many people working in, um, in the farms or on the field uh, to produce food, and so that freed up a lot of the workforce. And we'll talk more about that agricultural revolution later. Also along the era, we had improvements in transportation. New ship designs lowered the cost of transportation because it made travel faster and therefore made it cheaper. And so lots of stuff uh, began to change. Now, why is all this important? Well, let me tell you why it's important. Here's what it means. One, there is a way to produce, because of the agricultural revolution, more food and cheaper food, which is going to allow population to boom. If you have more food, more people are going to be able to eat. Uh, the price of food goes down. Lots more people are going to be able to eat. And you're also going to have a boom in population because people are going to be healthier. Two, faster, easier transportation. Because of the McAdam Road, people could travel from place to place much more easily, much more quickly. And in terms of uh, sea travel, that also became more quick and therefore more inexpensive as well. So now you can have more people moving around the world than you could ever before. So the McAdam Road, the Agricultural Revolution increased um, food, all weather roads and faster ships increased and eased transportation. That's all the enlightenment for today. That's all for this unit, and I hope you guys have a wonderful night.